a very good afternoon to all of you on behalf of department of computer science government general degree college shingur i onupam sen assistant professor of this department hearty welcome you students and faculty members from different colleges in this international webinar on reconfigurable computing and its future organized by iqc and department of computer science government general degree college shingur now i request our honorable principal sir dr shantanu chakraborty to kindly deliver inaugural speech sir over to you please hello hello am i audible yes sir okay i welcome everyone in today's international webinar reconfigurable computing and its future the field of reconfigurable computing becomes a revolutionary and hot topic that bridges the gap between the between the separate worlds of hardware and software design the key features of reconfigurable computing is its ground breaking ability to perform computations in hardware to increase performance while retaining the flexibility of a software solution we are happy to say that today our speaker dr shongit shaha will highlight this interesting field the endeavor of computer science department hod shondipan shomit and onupam is highly praiseworthy for organizing this kind of webinar iqac and the faculty members of our college are continuously supporting such events regularly and we regularly organize several uh, seminars and webinars on different topics i hope today's uh, program will be loved by all thank you all thank you sir for your constant support now i would like to request our iqc coordinator head and associate professor of department of history dr choitali choudhury to kindly deliver welcome address madam over to you please uh, very good afternoon our respected principal sir our distinguished speaker today faculty members and my beloved students i welcome you all in this international webinar on reconfigurable computing and its future organized by department of computer science in collaboration with iqac government general degree college shingur i want to thank our today speaker dr shongit shaha uh, senior research uh, officer school of computer science and electronic engineering university of essex uk a hearty welcome to you sir thank you for being here and to grace the occasion i also want to thank our computer science department departmental head and the other faculty members for such endeavor especially during these trying days i hope it will be a successful uh, webinar and i wish all the success thank you thank you madam for your constant encouragement now i would like to give brief introduction about today's speaker dr shongit shah dr shah completed his phd in 2017 as a tcs pcs research fellow after his phd he worked as a visiting scientist at isi kolkata since 1st may 2018 he is a senior research officer in national center for nuclear robotics based in eis lab School of Computer Science and Electronic Engineering at University of Essex, UK. He is also a recipient of Earn Mobility Award from EU Commission 2021 and associated with University of Bremen, Germany as a visiting fellow. Primarily his research expertise in the field of embedded system with specific interest that include real time scheduling scheduling of fpgas fault tolerance and approximation based real time computing soon he will be joining as a lecturer in the university of huddersfield uk now i welcome and request dr shaha to deliver his talk 
Uh, hi, hi. Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Dr. Chokravarti and Dr. Chaudhary, for your kind introductions. And it's a real pleasure to be here. And and my deepest regards to all the faculty members and all the dear students. It's it's a nice to be here. So uh, today's talk uh, is about uh, the reconfigurable computing in the field that in which I have been working for last couple of years. So uh, let's share my screen and 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 check if everything is visible. Uh, Okay. Uh, is it visible to all? Yes, it is visible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, 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 so, can I start right now? Is, is everybody is here, or or we should wait for some couple of people to join? No, you can start, sir. Okay. Thank you. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, so uh, welcome everybody, and uh, it's a Sunday. So uh, I thank you for being here, uh, and and I also told you that it's a real pleasure to be here. So uh, algorithm to architecture revisit the path of the FPGA. So when uh, when Shonti Pond uh, told me to uh, give a webinar here, I choose these topics because uh, in this particular topics where I, I have been working for last couple of years, and uh, this topic is now a very emerging fields and uh, lost over. Uh, more over the all the universities and all over the Europe and US and even India, the peoples are working in this field. And uh, I, will, I will in this talk, I will try to be uh, as specific as possible. I don't want to give the huge technical jargons, but mainly I will try to cover all the topics in a in a storytelling manner so that you can get the crux idea of this field. And I will also try to raise your interest on this particular field so that in your respective uh, position, you can also explore that field if it is, sounds interesting to you. And uh, also, I will provide the resources that uh, from where you could start uh, on this particular field. So all the topics, I will start from very basic. So some of uh, things will be uh, common to you and some of the things will not be common. So if you have any question, uh, I will be very happy to answer in between. You can just uh, put this question in your chat box or maybe we can take it uh, later after this talk. OK, uh, OK, so let's start. Uh, so when we we are all, I believe the maximum students here are the computer science uh, students. So in computer science, we always talk about two things. The one is this algorithm, and then this architecture. This is the two particular uh, field that uh, which uh, we really come across in all our day to day lives. So now when we try to visit the path with FPGAs because the general purpose processor and all our computing elements are there, then why we need actually the FPGAs. So that's why I will try to cover mainly that why we need this particular FPGAs. What are these FPGAs and where is they are applicable right now, in which field they are applicable. And I will also share some of my real life uh, experience and the projects that I'm currently doing here. So uh, let's start with uh, why. So why the FPGAs are required and and how the technologies evolves and why we actually need that. So uh, if we start the journey from why, I, I would like to say uh, that uh, in in our in our field, our mind, we want to see the world like this. You know, uh, it, it's a it's a particular lands and divided with the boundaries. And so this is a particular country, and this is a particular country, and they are sharing their uh, boundaries. And 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 it's a collection of, of of areas, and and this how we see the world. But when but this is a very very common uh, term in the old era. But in new era, everything is mobile. So people are not only living in their territory, but they are also communicating with each other. So I would like to see so world in this way because this is a picture that you can find in every port if you come here or if you go to the any European port, you can find these kind of big big containers are coming, and and they are stacked together like this. So each container, each colors, they represent some commodities that is coming from one particular country is going to another. So that means the people maybe are not mobile, but they are exchanging. They are exchanging goods. Now they are exchanging information. I am currently a couple of uh, thousands of miles away from you, but we, we are talking. You can hear my voice. You can see my screen. So we are exchanging data. And, and that's why the new world are so we are exchanging the goods, commodities, data, information every time. 
So uh, how how it actually started? So if we if we just started on back, so uh, this whole industry things we termed it as some kind of you know industry 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and we are currently in a 4.0. So uh, in how it started on industry 1.0. It's all started late eighteenth uh, century when the before that people just used to do any kind of work with his hands. So it's all about manual labor. Then people invented the steam power and water. So it, that they have now the machines is operating by uh, some steam and uh, water power. So you can you can relate it to as a, our old days we have a, we had to have a, a steam engine. So this is the first industry revolution happened in one point zero when people see the first machines. So uh, then the time passed by and uh, people started the electricity invented. It's, it's, a, it's a huge invention. And then the people are saying that, okay, rather than having the streams and water, we can now have electricity. So huge machines can move right now. So it can be termed as a second industrial revolution. And after that, uh, maybe after this, uh, when the electricity involvement, say after the Second World War and something in, in 1970s, 80, when the digital electronics evolved, uh, the industrial revolution comes and it's become a term has been floated. It's called the mechatronics. That means we have the mechanical part as well as it is coupled with some electronics. So it is a third revolution happened. So where the robots, people can see, people can see digital equipments there. And lastly, now on 2011 onwards, in Germany, the big automobiles company like uh, Mercedes-Benz and, and Bosch, they have coined the term Industry 4.0 and currently we are at this area. So where everything is now digitized as well as it has an IP address. So uh, all these fancy terms have been floated. So cloud computing, IoT, and, and all these terms are now there because everything has an IP address and they can communicate to each other. And now that new term has appeared, it's called the cyber physical system. So that means cyber means we have some computing power as well as it has internet and it can operate a physical system which is remotely, which is not adjacent to it, but it is remotely there and it can operate that physical system. So cyber physical system actually appeared right now. So it's a big journey. Uh, so from 17th, 18th century to 200, industry 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. .0. So basic thing is that more and more we are uh, bringing complexity. So we need more and more computation power. That's a, that's a key idea. So uh, uh, when this industry 4.0 happens, the the people, I, I, I this can be sheet, uh, a big company here, their research director says that, well, people do not have to go to the company. They can work remotely. And now it is in COVID era, something is something like this is happening. People, uh, through, they are connected to the big, big machines. They are operating through their computers uh, up to uh, certain accuracy. And, and it is actually possible. It's possible due to uh, this uh, cyber physical system. So uh, and and these terms are are called as the uh, as the smart factories nowadays. So everything which can operate from remotely, it's it it it, it is can through the internet, uh, people can work in factories and and operate their uh, particular machines. But all you need you need an internet and you need some kind of computing capability. So uh, once we have these uh, smart factories. Uh, Next thing is that the system have become intelligent day and day. So uh, from if you remember that I started with Industry 1.0. So Industry 1.0, where the people are only deals with mechanical parts. So if I have a big car or even a big ship, it or it does have only a mechanical part. So it has its wheel, it has its ball bearings and all this stuff. So it's around Industry 1.0. And then when the industry two and three comes, uh, the things become more complex for our own flexibility. It's 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 as have the mechanical part as well as electronics. Now you can see the car is no longer a mechanical part. It has nearly 80 processors nowadays. So whether you are pushing your brakes, whether you are driving your steering wheels, it's all the microcontrollers are there who are which are actually controlling the whole thing. So. Car is not a mechanical right now. It's a more of an electronic systems. So it's around industry 2.0 and 3. And uh, when this particular industry 
at 4.0 comes so we are talking about intelligent systems so systems can operate by themselves so we are now incorporating artificial intelligence machine learning so that machine are intelligent enough to take their decisions so these transitions from mechanical to mechatronics to intelligent system this gives a very 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 common flavor is that we are making the things complex for our own flexibility and once the things are complex then you have lots of job to do because things are getting complex you have lots more data to process you have to have a good computation power if the things are simple you are happy with the less computation power but if the th are getting complex and you are demanding lots of things from the from a system that your system can do by job by themselves so you are now have to prepare that you have to give a new paradigm of computation power because uh, the electronics this has some capacity the memory it has some capacity it cannot be increased after a certain limit so once this intelligent system happens so let's talk about the some basic basic system so uh, in general purpose system so whenever we hire, you hear the word computer we we all think about that it, it could be a pc or it could be a laptop and and something a desktop like sort of things so basically system is something which if you give some inputs it calculates and it sends you back some output but these are called the general purpose computer but there is another type of uh, uh, system which is very common nowadays uh, Uh, though it's not be classified as a so called computer or server or laptop but processors and computation uh, does happen there every time and these are known as uh, embedded system so why it's called embedded system because the computing system is embedded within the electronic device your phone it it it, it does have a huge number of processor inside it so it's an embedded system your your washing machine your refrigerator everything and 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 this particular system we can say that this is designed to carry out a particular uh, task because not we are talking about the smartphones but the phone which used to be a couple of years ago that phone is only for audio processing we can hear that we can send smss but we can't do any kind of computation or computer like stuffs uh, on our old phones right now so it is dedicated for you know for voice processing for information processing so you can't say that well this is the definition of an embedded system but you can say that nearly any computer system other than the desktop it can be classified as an embedded system and and i must say that well this pc these uh, laptops they produce millions in a year but the embedded system are produced billions in a year and 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 you might have one a uh, computer or desktop in your house but you have 50% or 50 par, uh, other other stuffs which has this embedded system you have your refrigerator you have your mobile phone you have your watch your smart watch and everything so that has some computation power itself so computer is not necessarily has to be within a laptop or, uh, or or a desktop it has to be in any system which does calculate one thing so so this is the one embedded systems part and uh, and now uh, i i i came across with this term so people are usually say smartphone smart system so this is not a very uh, uh, a very established nomenclature that but i i used to uh, express smart in in this way uh, because it actually makes sense so smart if i if i take every letter of this word smart you can say that s is something called sense so we have a system and it has some other sensors so it sends the data then m is for the memorize that means whatever the data you are sensing you have to store it and that's why we you actually require the very good knowledge and of the data structure because it has to be stored in a structured environment once it got memorized you have to analyze that means whatever you are getting it's it's knowledge but knowledge has to be transformed to some information for the machine so that's the big difference from knowledge and information so that's why you need analyze and when there is analyze that means you are putting pressures on your systems that they it has to collect a good information from your knowledge so again you need a computation power and then uh, after analyzing it has to respond that yes i am sensing something so i have to respond i have to respond within a time other other otherwise i will collide so think of a robot it it it's sensing that something obstacle is coming so i have to take the decision the some the wall is in front of me so i have to stop or i have to bypass it otherwise i am going to collide with the uh, with the wall and if i collide then i will not be called as smart so so that's why the robot has to uh, has to 
calculate or has to conduct a lots of computation inside of it. And when I am saying the computation, that means we are making things complex. So we have to think of some different way. Uh, and this smart, and we are also called it as autonomous system because they are automatic. They have the logic and reasoning power. The left hand side is called a Roomba. It's a very common here. Uh, uh, and also, I think in everywhere right now, it, it can replace your maid. So these are the automatic cleaning robots. It can navigate through your floor and it, 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 it detects the dart very easily and it, it just cleans up. So it has some intelligence power, but also it has the embedded and computing system inside of it, which executes a tons of tons of code, a tons of tons of algorithms. But uh, uh, but it's always our our passion that we do not need to recharge it properly. So it has to be power con power concentration should be there because it should be power efficient. Otherwise, if the battery runs out, then we are not happy with this product. And also uh, in in autonomous system, we have uh, seen. Uh, in the driverless cars, because the cars uh, do not have any driver right now. You just sit in the car, and the car will take take you to your destination. And 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 this way, this is the example of some autonomous system. So uh, what we have seen, so this evolution path from Industry 1.0. So we started back in 17th century. The things were pretty simple that day. Uh, just a just a engine and and is running with some water vapor and stream engine. Then we making thing complex. We bringing electricity. Then we make digitize digitization the digital electronic. And now we need a, everything to be connected to the internet. And it has to have some kind of analytic power. So we are making things complex for ourselves. And and that's why computation is getting tough day by day. So at these evolutions, I I would like to say just one uh, that. This one is a it's a computer, general purpose computer. Then I must say card is an embedded system because it has lots of processors, microcontrollers. Even cards do have APGs nowadays. So they, they actually calculate the distance, the, your petrols and your mileage and everything. And also in autonomous system, that's I will treat the car, I will sit in the car, I will do chatting, and car will take me uh, to my destination. So whenever we are getting rely we are relying on our systems and we 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 have such kind of demands from our system that well you will do the job and with some analysis analysis and logic power so we have to you have to provide a, some kind of computation to them otherwise it's, it's very tough because you are making the thing complex there so once this uh, system evolution happens uh, so whether it's a uh, it's an embedded system or general purpose system or it's autonomous system. Just forget about it. it. It's all the anatomy is basic level is same. That is, you have some sensors and you have to have some actuators. That means through which you would react and you are sensing. So this is, this is particularly the input and this is the output. And in between, you have to have memory where you will store your data. And uh, as well as you have to have a processor. Now, this is actually making things complex. So how fast I can run my processors and uh, which frequency I can run it. And also heating is a big issue uh, because it's taking lots of power. So these things we have to take care. So what, whether, whether you are making the things autonomous and whatever you do, put uh, lots of computation power, but you have to think of this processor and processing capability because uh, if you demand more from your system, you have to provide a very good uh, computation power because things are nowadays are, are very, very complex. Uh, so uh, once we, I talk that uh, we, we have to have a very good uh, processing capability. Uh, so this is this is my one of the favorite uh, picture. So uh, it comes that all the basic basic details that we need when I talk about the algorithm to architecture. So uh, so whenever it says, for example, it's it's your phone. So when you when you just run an apps, it's it's application, but. At the, at the bottom of it, it's an algorithm. Some, some algorithm is running. And this algorithm has been written in some code. So some, someone did this job for you. And then it has to run on top of some operating system. Uh, it's Android, it could be uh, iOS and something. Forget about virtual machines because it's some kind of OS are now uh, using cloud computing. And then uh, this instruction set architecture is actually uh, needed. That means that Whatever the higher level language you can write in C, Python, whatever your language you have written, the processor uh, must have to understand that. So that means this is the processor readable uh, uh, thing, an ISA. And then there are circuits. 
that means uh, you have this fabrication for example your motherboard or the circuit board whatever you're thinking then there is a device that means it could be pc mos and modern day they are using a fin fit a very modern transistors they are using and at the bottom it, it is a physics so whatever you are running on the top of your phone in application at the bottom level it some circuit some current is passing from your circuit so that's why something happening so one becoming zero zero becoming one and all this is our, our, our abstraction level we the, as a user we do not have we do not think about this uh, so, so someone is taking care of for you but when you are designing a system you have to take care of it because users are only bothers about their apps they need it to run seamlessly in your phone so i need to run these apps these apps these apps and 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 then at the bottom so these many layers we have to take care uh, particularly which ways i should choose uh, which processor i should choose and and how this uh, because it has to be converged uh, to in in the physics and in circuit levels uh, that's why when it actually happens then your apps is actually running so this is all the abstractions but we have to take care in in between them so now we we, we got one feelings uh, is that the systems becoming complex and uh, now the modern system becoming smart we are expecting lots of thing from this system so we have to take care of, of our processing capabilities so it's it's all about a, you know it's it's all about a design and analysis so uh, so i have to design it and i have to analyze that whether my design and whether this architecture i should use it or not so he, here comes uh, uh, i i would say it's a creativity and 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 it's a cost performance analysis so that means if if you design something uh, which is very costly and uh, and performance wise it's is not that good then it's a definitely bad idea so we 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 definitely look for something which is performance wise is good as well as it is less costly so we need something like that because you know uh, a processor can be increased its its computation power can be increased but it may be too costly and if your devices if your phones are too costly then no people will are going to buy it so that's why we have to think of something alternative so that we can we can down the cost we can cut the cost as well as we are getting what we want we want performance because we are making thing complex uh, and and so design in and this design and analysis we have to think of that what are the other paradigms of computations are possible so now it is the the computer uh, the whatever the processors the microprocessors whatever you have we have so do do we actually require something something else so the answer is yes we we do require that and and that's the concept i i must say that it it's a, it's a loop between the application and technology when take when the applications are become becoming uh, complex it's your responsibility to tell the technology has to be improved and when the technology actually improves then it will also help to design to make the application more and more and more complex so once i have these applications i am making think uh, things complex i am using industry 4.0 my system is now become autonomous i have i have provided the logical power uh, to my system my system can automate themselves so i have to improve my technology and once i improve my technology then i can also change in the application well i can put so many features in my apps right now because my technology uh, supports it so this way it's a two it's a two way process that is happens so i believe that uh, when the industry 4.0 happens in and 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 the people are looking for some alternate solutions that well uh, the computation power the processors the, i can't raise the frequency indefinitely so i have to look for something new and and then they 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 think about this reconfigurable uh, computer the configurable computers were present before that but it it is now become a very lucrative solutions uh, for the for the people when the application application demands so technology changes so uh, when this uh, i i would like to quote this one uh, uh, professor professor giral he, uh, he is a very big computer scientist in, in california los angeles and and in 1960s uh, Uh, he made this word so i just want to say that uh, we have we have to have uh, some sophisticated uh, network that can readjust themselves obviously 1960 there is not internet but he is talking about you know the electrical circuits and all the stuff so he gave the first idea that 
something if if something readjustment should be there so if there is a fault can i reconfigure the system so that fault can be bypassed and and suppose there is three ways one two three so if one is faulty can my system uh, can i use the system in such a way so that the other non faulty parts can it follow so so that it can continue the operation so i i personally believe this is a very fast uh, term in 1960s when the term actually floated uh, of this reconfigurable computing and 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 let's see what is the configurable computer so so this is the end of our first kind of journey so we we are now end of why uh, i i hope you got the basic essence that how the industry evolution happened how the systems change how we are making things com complex for our own comfort and and now it demands lots of computation power so we have to think something away so this is the end of journey of why and i and we should we should make a journey of uh, of what is actually the configurable computing so so let's start of what is the configurable computing so uh, uh, when it, it, it's the configurable computing you can imagine from its type it's it's, it's term it, it, its name is it's called the configurable so which can be again and again can be configured so it's the that means that if we have this circuit and and it is also you can you are quite uh, 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 you are accustomed with this circuit you know it's it's quite we are familiar to this because it can be seen in in our computer motherboard or in you know in our phone circuit but thing is that once this circuit is fabricated uh, can we make changes uh, after fabrication so that is the main question so i i can make integrated circuit and and these integrated circuits are really really uh, fascinating they can work fast and and they can they can provide us what we need but can we reconfigure it after it's it's come from the factory so that is the main thing is that which reconfigurable computation is something where you can change the circuit board after its fabrication so this is the and as per our needs because you know that what we what we learned so far because the application domains are changing we are demanding huge computation power and so one one particular one application and one circuit for that application is is no longer a very very promising so if there is something situation like that is i have this integrated circuit and if there is the application one is running in my circuit then my circuit is can run application one and if there is something application two then my my circuit can reconfigure itself to run application two if there is application three it can again reconfigure itself for, for application three and and that sounds really nice so that's actually what the apg does so uh, this is on the reconfigurable computing and and uh, you can see this picture so in reconfigurable computing is about the implementation of circuits after fabrication so uh, we 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 know how to write programs you know that if we have c codes or java and something then we just write it there's a compiler you are using some kind of compiler that compiles and and makes some executable file and dump it in your processor and you are done but can we represent uh, hardware circuits like a program and if i uh, compiled it 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 become executable file like a binaries and and can i dump it on on a particular particular circuit board and the answer is yes you can and that what ex exactly the apg does so circuit is no longer hardware because here uh, everything is programmable so we are representing a circuit in a language manner it's not like c but we can we call it as hdl so it's a hardware description language and then we can we can compile it it become executable you you, you just download it to your your board uh, and and then uh, it 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 can start working as per as per your logic so so this is actually the apg looks like and so apgs are called the field programmable gate arrays so field programmable means that after fabrication in field you have the whole right to program it and gate arrays means that i i don't know whether uh, how many uh, the, the students if you were uh, familiar with this term logic gates in you know digital circuits so this is the same same thing like this so it's a some that the array of gates and which were actually used to uh, represent any kind of uh, digital function so uh, we can program them to make any kind of digital function and and here is how it actually works uh, so we have our computer say you have laptop with you and and where you might draw a schematic or you can write a, a hdl code 
to represent your logic function. What I am saying about logic function, it could be anything. It could be as simple as your, say, you are designing an AND gate, A dot B equal to C. And even it could be complex, like you are making your own processor, or maybe you are doing a video processing algorithms, everything you can write in HDL. So once you write, uh, all the softwares will, will make a, a binary file for you. It's like executable file. And, and if, you, if you download uh, that, yeah, so your laptop uh, will be connected uh, to this board. And these are the all, the, this is particularly the port where through a wire, uh, your laptop will be connected to the FPGA. And once you just click, then your FPGA starts uh, doing your function. If you are, if you are uh, putting an AND gate, then it starts doing your AND gate. If you are implementing a video processing algorithm, then it started doing that. So, and, and the good thing is that it can be reconfigured multiple times. So if it is a fixed circuit, and suppose I am I, I did and coded a shorting algorithm, and then I, I, am, I am selling this chip, that this particular chip is dedicated for shorting. No other uh, functionalities can be incorporated there. That's, that's, the, that's the problem with uh, the integrated circuit. But if it is FPGA, it can do shorting and it can do other stuffs. As per your as per your requirement, so these are very basic uh, FPGA board and uh, Xilinx and uh, Altera. We will we'll look into that. So uh, uh, so uh, so two kind of uh, reconfiguration happens inside inside the FPGA. One it one it's called the full reconfiguration. That means your entire FPGA needs to be reconfigured, and another is called partial. That some parts of your FPGA you can reconfigure. So so take this uh, example. So. Uh, suppose uh, this is my FPG and this is my base stream. So suppose my I have an application, say, shorting algorithm, and this shorting algorithm has some. Uh, it it runs up. Its its input is twenty array. Some shorting algorithm is up to thirty array. Some al al algorithm say, has an input of forty arrays. So if I download this base stream, your shorting algorithm start running. So three algorithms, three applications started running. So you are configuring the entire FPG. And, and now you are done with shorting, uh, say ascending shorting, now you have to do something descending. And again, for three different inputs, that's all. You, you just to, to uh, compile it, you, you another full base stream, and you simply download it. It did just all the your previous history wiped up, and, and you are getting your new, new results like this. So it is as cool as that. Yeah. So, so this is how the full reconfiguration happens. But uh, FPG has become more and more uh, promising when when it started providing the partial reconfiguration nearly around around seven years ago and so what is happening the it, it, it is much more fancy so suppose you have a design here and which is uh, doing some kind of video processing algorithm and i, I would like to configure uh, some part of my design so design a is running here and then you say that well uh, this board uh, after this video processing i would like to do some kind of audio processing similarly no problem on that you can do that and uh, without interacting design a you can download and your audio processing algorithm and design b and then uh, there someone came and say that whatever you are doing i want to do something else uh, so no problem with that yeah, you can do in design c so it, it that's cool so we can utilize the part without interrupting other Design A when is running, it can run design C without interrupting. And and even uh, by you can withdraw design A and you can dump uh, design D as well as if you, if you require you can do that. So that's the basic feature. So it can reconfigure at runtime. You don't have to think of well, this is the dedicated circuit for you know for video processing. So how can I do that? But one one thing I must to say that uh, uh, that this this dedicated circuit are really faster. But it's not flexible. So uh, uh, vendor-wise, the uh, FPGA Altera was a was a very a big vendor and Xilinx. So when I started working nearly uh, nearly twelve years ago in this field, uh, Altera and Xilinx were the only one. But then Intel saw prospect uh, in this, uh, so Intel jumped in, and Intel completely acquired the FPGA world right now. And and I think that in your PC, Intel PC and Intel processor, in, you are going to getting have. You are going to have a uh, uh, FPGA based uh, PC very soon uh, because Intel is working very hard on this particular uh, field, and uh, and as I told you about that, uh, uh, so question comes that uh, why this FPGA is important. So uh, first thing is that you you must remember that whenever you are executing something in software, that's really good, but software what happens? The problem is that 
it has to be, it's a really sequential process. So suppose you have something, so you have to phase that data, then you have decode and execute. So phase, decode, execute, these are the cycles that, that happens for a software execution. But for hardware, it's, it's like, you know, it's a parallel execution, it's a concurrent execution. So if you, if you want to add something for software, you know, for, for for loop, you have to do it sequentially. For adder, for, for hardware, it's like, a, it's like a, you, are, you are just using a couple of, so you have to add 16 times. So, and if your inputs are parallel, then you can implement simple 16 adders parallelly and you can get your job done. So sometimes it's, it's really, really much faster than an than FPGA, uh, but uh, when to use an FPGA. So, so this is the questions that uh, as a system engineer, I always think on, on this way that uh, FPGA is very good. Uh, so if you need something uh, called uh, flexibility as well as performance, then if you should go for FPGA. But if you think that, well, I, I am not bothered about performance, but I need flexibility. So the general purpose processors, say, whatever the microprocessors and the, the quad-core Intel processor, whatever is present in your phones, it's, it, it's quite enough. And, and if you read that, yes, I do not need flexibility, but a, say for NVIDIA, in, in particular for graphics card, when the games processing happens, they say that if, if I learn, if, I, if we are playing some computer games, what happens in the bottom of that, uh, we have to execute lots of lots of matrix multiplication. So if this matrix multiplication are, we make a dedicated circuit for matrix multiplication. So that is that is much important. So they do go for ASIC, but FPGAs is like that. If I need something that I do not require, because sometimes I'm doing matrix multiplication, I sometimes need some other operations. So I should go for it. And 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 FPGA becomes uh, a more lucrative solutions for for flexibility as as well as uh, performance, so it is in between that. So uh, next is that uh, it's 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 lots of technical jargons. I don't want to give, but it just to show that how the magic happens. So uh, the magic thing is that these are the all the called the basic building blocks. So it's a logic. It's all about some circuits uh, there. So it has the memory. Uh, it it has to be clocked. So for whatever you are doing, say suppose I have written a video processing algorithm in HDL and your system compiled it and then with the help of these building blocks you know it, it's actually mapped inside the fpga so so this is something called uh, configurable logic blocks and these logic blocks actually you can say it, it's it's like a bricks you know when you are when you are building your house it's the, you are setting bricks one after another and it's it turns and turns into a whole wall it's, it's something like this so it, this is this is something like a clb so uh, by connecting these CLVs and these CLV passing the data. So all your algorithms is translated into a circuit and then it is printed, mapped inside the, inside the FPJ. So uh, uh, if we see that how we can do that, uh, I must say that you first go for the, uh, we have to write some HDL code for that. And uh, once the HDL uh, code, so all these steps are carried out by any simulators. So you can go to the Xilinx software, and if you want to, if you are new, then you can just go. The softwares are always free to download. You can just go and, and start uh, downloading and start playing with it. So you can write a simple VSDL. And then the next part is the synthesis. That means uh, it, it, what the synthesis means is it's simply like, you know, uh, when we are working in breadboard, we are connecting with wires. So it is same like that. And then it's uh, implementations. So that means it's doing something so that uh, it 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 generating a something a code a machine executable code which is understandable to the for the FPGA so it is like you know the dot bit file or the executable file it's it's producing and then you just download and and that's all your your FPGA starts uh, doing on that uh, so if you and 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 best thing is that you can go back so that is the feedback part so. If it is ASIC, then it is an integrated circuit, then there is a no, you, you can't go back there. But if you have if you have written an HDL applications and you can say, well, I need to make my different application, you just go back and write a separate HDL for it and then synthesize and then follow this rule, just download and then that's all your, your APG starts working as, as per your as per your wish. So so this is the part. Okay. Uh, so uh, so far uh, what we what we have learned is you no know, uh, some some of you um, might think that FPGA is you know for hardware engineers and I have to I have to uh, go for VSDLs and and stuff. So 
uh, xylings, I think, uh, think this way, and they they flow they floated these terms that FPGA is for software engineers. So you can, if you are good in Python, if you are good in um, uh, uh, some C programming language and some others, you can you can fascinately you can work on FPGAs. It's it's no longer that you, you need to have a knowledge of HDL. So so they come up with this solution uh, and uh, and and. So it has it is calling that uh, programmable logic. So that means we have FPGA as well as we have processors. So they bring both sides together. You know, so we have ARM processors like uh, and as well as we have the FPGA fabric or logic that as I have shown you the CLB block. So that uh, because uh, you know sometimes it it requires that for some applications that if it is parallel parallelizable, then. Uh, you, you, you should go for FPG, but if it is sequential, then you will not get much benefit on that. So uh, processor-based execution is uh, much, much more appreciated that uh, then. And so that's the that's the basic fund, uh, fundamentals of this. So we have you can execute C code uh, here in, in, in your processor. You, you don't have to take this much pain of, of your writing HDL. And 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 if you if you know HDL, then sometimes you can write and uh, and, and use it uh, as a as a PG, you know, for Raspberry Pi and Arduino boards are there, which has uh, some kind of processor. So uh, Xilinx want to give this uh, process. So if you do not require FPGA, just you just use the ARM process, ARM board. And if you require FPGA, then write this. So uh, use this part, this YOLO part as a as a FPGA. So uh, in my experience, for the last couple of years, we are designing for for lots of companies, and and we use both. Uh, so it's it's a huge uh, uh, headache for engineer to how to uh, execute some of the uh, application in ARM in like a software and how how much you you will implement it on the HDL. So it's called hardware software partitioning and uh, and basically if you see any applications on FPGAs, even FPGAs are now it is available on card itself. So here we always use this kind of system. So it has processors. Some task is running on the processor and some task is running on the FPGA because it's hardware. It can be parallelizable. We can get huge benefit of it and it's reconfigurable. So we, we, if, if the if same FPGAs can be used for, you know, for mileage detection and for audio uh, in a car. So if the, uh, the user wants to detect his mileage, so he just press a button. So again, you just reconfigure the FPGA. It calculates the algorithm. It shows you mileage. Then it said, okay, I'm not going to do that. I have to do something audio. And you just click that. You reconfigure the FPGA and you, you get that. So that's that's a very flexible. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, now I just want to show you that uh, uh, how, because there's lots of tools are available here. I am not going to on that details, but I am to, going to give you a very visual, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, visual uh, inspection so that you can see that how the things we, we design a system on, on FPGA. So we have a processor, so it's called the processing system. You can think of a, any processor, it's an ARM processor. So once the processor is that, the processor should be connected with uh, the memory and peripheral. So that's that, that's the obvious thing. So you have to choose some bus. So this is the bus. So uh, once I have a processor, I have bus, I, I need to provide the memories and uh, all, the, all my peripherals. So I add a memories and GPIO, that is called general purpose input output, and I have added some peripherals. So this is the basic, uh, my architecture. It is somehow it is connected to your VRAM and your memories and all that. And then, then you are you generate the hardware and, and then your, uh, you generate a file that contains all your hardware information. And, uh, and then when your FPGA comes, you just, uh, from your tools, you just drop this uh, file with some wire connected to this FPGA. And, 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 and you, you, your FPGA, all the hardware parameters are ready. So once you are ready with your hardware, what is your next job? It's your next job is to write the software applications for it. So go for it. Uh, you write it. So you have your test code, say something. So you, I usually write on system C code, but nowadays you can write in PineQ, R, whatever you have. FPGs have compiler for everything. So you can write your codes and your software applications and compile it. And uh, it, it, it will generate some... Uh, executable file and, and that's all you dump it and so you you made your hardware ready you make your software ready so your application 
should run it. So these are all the tools uh, I can take care of you, but you, you have to generate, you have to operate the tools and, and you have to, obviously you are using the tool <laughs> there might be lots of error that you have to solve, but, uh, but this is the basic steps and so that we usually follow. Uh, and, and, and another thing is that I, I, I heard this term a long before uh, that we are going from lab to MATLAB. So that means MATLAB is everywhere. So if MATLAB is everywhere, then how MATLAB can't help you to write HDL codes? Yeah, MATLAB is also, again, a severe here as well. So if you have MATLAB, then you do not have to take this huge pain of writing HDLs. Uh, if you have algorithm, and then MATLAB can help you to reach the path of architecture. So Jainq is the name of the FPG, as I told you. So MATLAB can help you up on that. So you, you in MATLAB, you can write your MATLAB codes and then it can be converted on the hardware definition languages. And if you can, maybe you can just design your system. So this is the input, there is a switch and I can design that. And again, it can be converted to HDL. So HDL means MATLAB will do that and MATLAB will compile it so that your FPGA can understand it. So it is more like that if you do not like HDLs and, and more if you are a software kind of guy, then you should go for it. Uh, and it, it's all it's all present there. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, we we got uh, the our, we are almost finished our second journey. That is uh, that is what what is APTA. So we finished why we finished what, and now we should go where where is actually uh, available and where where the people can see it and where the APTAs are now using. And here I can I can share some of my experience that in in real life where I am using it. So, so let's go to journey that where, where the FPGs I, I got there. I hope you got the basic uh, of the ideas that why we need that at first we make our things, our life complex, then we demand for uh, you know high high performance computing, then we then we go for FPGs and FPGs is now it is FPGs coupled with processor. It's a, it's a very good solution nowadays. Now we see that uh, where is actually possible. So if you start where, so uh, fast APGs are, I actually, in, I did lots of projects here in, in, in APGs and uh, and it's all about the autonomous car. There is a, a project of uh, of this car company, big car company, Mercedes-Benz, and, and, and it's a huge European project and where we have to write the algorithms for video processing of a lane detection. So what happens if, if the car is moving, it has the camera, and it has to uh, process the lanes and it has to make some uh, make the image sharpening so this is one kind of application i'm telling about so uh, traditionally what you can do uh, we can use our processor uh, for video sharpening you can write uh, any code of it you are taking the video you have to make it sharp do that with the processor but our our, our idea is that if the FPGA makes any difference and if it is faster and, and the results are really fascinating. Now the question will come that how faster? I can show you graphically. So this is the data I, uh, we did in a real life project with Mercedes-Benz and, and we can see, you can see that with the processor and this FPGA is that much faster because in this video sharpening tool, this algorithm can be parallelizable. And if it is parallelizable, then you can you can write these multiple units in parallel and where the software depends on, you know, sequential execution. So that's the, you, you get a huge benefit on that. So uh, so this is one applications we did. Uh, you can see that this is a particular applications and now it's, it's sharpening uh, after that. And uh, and this is that at, at our university uh, in, in our project, we, we did that. Uh, it's a, it's a, it took huge time to do that, but it's really fun to doing this. Uh, it has input stream, you know, this is the, how the lanes are there. So our, our work is to the detect the ages of the lane and so that we, our system can identify uh, in, in HDMI, you can see that huge data rate is coming. So it's all real time. So you are putting a, a nearly a 70, 720p videos on your FPGA. So this is our FPGA. And 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 it, it can detect the lane and converting in on, on this particular uh, thing. And and this is a new FPGA, it's called the uh, Fine Q. That means uh, it supports Python. So if you if, if, to write this whole project, you don't have to take much pain of HDL. You can depend on Python language and it's much faster. So in industry, the people are actually using it. And 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 also uh, we have uh, use these these tabs uh, 
on on robots as well. So uh, if, if this is a this is a particular project where robot has to grasp something, so uh, we we put FPGAs and and it is much cheaper and and it actually worked very well. And and lastly, I I I want to talk about uh, this project, which is which is very close. Uh, I I really associated with this on space applications. So uh, you can know you can see that FPGAs are nowadays in using in satellites as well. So our 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 project uh, uh, is with uh, NASA JPL, and 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 the weird thing happens uh, when we send the this uh, satellite. This satellite contains a Xilinx FPGA. And everything was was fine here, but if you send it to the uh, outer orbit of the Earth in, in space, you know there you are going to face a loss of radiation. There could be neutrons, uh, heavy particles that are going to hit your FPGA, and and uh, and you know something wrong happens there. So uh, what the, what is called is called the you know single event upset. That means uh, I told you that it's all about the memory. So this is a this is a particle. This is the FPGA memory, and it's all storing some one zero 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 one. So this is the logic. So then, a suddenly a charged particle does uh, hit say some neutrons hit uh, because it is outer orbit and huge amount of radiations are there. So uh, when this charged particle hits, it's just a, just a mere bit flip. So zero becomes one, one becomes zero, and if a single bit flips, your whole algorithm. Uh, starts behaving crazy so it's a it's a it's a huge project that we we so what we do usually before uh sending our these fpgs in the space uh we usually recreate uh the the environment here in the art so uh how we create that because uh, for this we have huge laboratory here and where uh, in in art you are uh, in space you are going to suffer from neutrons you are going to suffer from muons uh, so you, you in this particular laboratory we recreate this uh, you know, we have neutron source we have muon source and and we we hit uh, our fpj with this particle and see how it uh, how it works and then we write algorithms so that uh, if any any bit flip happens we can manage it so uh, i can share uh, one of this uh, video you can see that it, this is a camera that white uh, uh, dots is that the neutron, the particles is actually hitting the camera. So uh, you can see that how much so nearly a million or billion times of neutrons are hitting the camera, and and this is how we we do that. So this is the neutron source, and we we put all the, our FPGAs in line, uh, and so that uh, if something wrong happens, we we in your control room we just checking that uh, whether we we can uh, manage this kind of you know upsets. Uh, yeah. So this is one uh, applications, and this is the project with NASA JPL that we are currently uh, working at, and uh, and this is the this is the one that the FPGAs can be used, and and I just I told you about this from autonomous car to space and everywhere the FPGAs has is huge uh, application because it, it it does provide the configurability and it has some disadvantages, but. Uh, but its advantages is much more, and and again uh, you you can see that uh, though the FPGAs are not suitable in in outer in, in space, but still we are making it suitable by creating you know the space environment inside the inside the Earth. So so this is the uh, I think this is the end of our web journey, and 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 now I would like to say that if all the students and if you if you really would like to know about uh, more. Uh, on this FPGS, and if it is if it is sounds interesting to you, and you want to plunge yourself on this on this particular field, then uh, I I must say that you can start with uh, uh, Xilinx University program. Uh, so you can just uh, take this name and Google it. Uh, it's like a Xilinx University program. is It's a free program uh, where you can get all the study materials, and even you 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 can all, uh, the faculty members if you really like to start uh, your uh, project students. Uh, on, on this, so you can you can you can take the advantage of it. You can write a proposal, and usually Xilinx donates all the PGA boards, and uh, you can also have these Altera boards available in India. I believe within within thousand rupees. So it's a good way to start. That's I told you earlier that softwares are easily downloadable. It's, it's not costly. So what you have to think, you have to think of the of the board. But anyway, if you have the a passion you can start uh, doing uh, on on self softwares so that you can run hdls and because in this industry we have a huge demands of you know fpg engineers and semiconductor engineers
uh, and so uh, i would suggest uh, a few books so these these two big books are are really written by one of the intel engineers and so very funny books you, you can just go and download it's free downloadable uh, it is it's not a textbook it's like it's like a story they have taken about why a pg is required and very very funny instance it's provided and uh, this website i really find uh, i really find very useful uh, pgforfun.com you can go and it's at lots of projects uh, projects available for simulations projects available for hardware uh, whatever you like you just go and 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 learn to it and and lastly for students who are really interested i think i can help you on that you, you can go to calcutta i don't know how much is possible in 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 uh, in this covid era but uh, in, if you go to the calcutta university in solde campus they have huge uh, apg labs and being an alma mater from there i i think i can uh, some students if want to go do some project work here i think they can do that uh, after covid era might be because uh, now it is nothing is possible so so i, I think we are uh, now end uh, of this of this talk so uh, if if i if i conclude i always conclude with this one so it's like that uh, uh, a very strong words but it's true that fpgas are not a uh, cots it means the commercial of the self technology that is and you cannot walk into a pc store and buy a pj card because i think you got the idea it is not like that which is ready to work right now because it it's a pj but you have to make it work as per your requirement whether uh, if whatever the algorithms you need what is your design requirement so it's not like a not like a circuit or not like a board which is ready to use right now but you can buy it and you have to program yourself uh, you have to have a good idea about what kind of systems you are looking for and then i i must encourage you uh, that uh, nearly 12 years ago i started uh, my pj journey by designing a simple and gate and now i am doing this stuff so it's, it's it's a really really interesting field if you really want to uh, work on this so uh, so that's all from my side and and thanks it's a really honor you have been wonderful uh, so if you have any easy questions then you can ask me now and uh, if you have some hard questions i prefer to hear from email so that that's all thank you one second shondipan for calling me here and it's real pleasure uh, thank you thank you dr shah uh, it's been a wonderful talk uh, now i would okay. like to share the questions uh pinaki de pinakshi de asks can i use fpj in intrusion detection system uh, of, uh, obviously because of what whatever your algorithm has uh, i i think people already already did that you, you know any kind of computation any kind of algorithm whatever you think you can do that but but before that what i what i used to uh, tell you that uh, if i go to my slide and so the thing is that uh you have to think about this way that how much you can do in this part actually so if if the software part sits uh, really because if, whether how much parallelization can be done in your algorithm so otherwise you have to design your algorithm so such a way that you can utilize this part so this is the always question that how much fpg will help you it depends on your algorithm how you have written your algorithm and and there is a part that your algorithm can be written in a hardware specific way so you can do that always so yeah you should go for it but before that just make a study that way how much parallelizable is your algorithm is and if it is huge enough go for it you will definitely get huge gain uh, i i believe i must say that yeah thank you and uh, any other questions i i hope you i go I, I, it's answered but if it is not uh, you can ask me now or i am always available on mail you can hit me a mail any time yeah okay thank you dr shah uh, one uh, question is from my, my side is yeah uh, what is the uh, extendability or how much uh, can we extend the functionality of uh, fpga uh is it uh, from the part of the software or is it limited to the uh manufacturers that how much they are providing how much flexibility uh, they are providing yeah like yeah. xilinx or uh, yeah. other yeah. other companies uh, yeah 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 i i got your question it's a very nice question so i i, I must say that uh, yes there are some limitations because you know uh, these are i told you about this these are the basic building blocks of the fpg so there is some limitation from the manufacturer side that how large is your fpga 
so if your fpg is large then you can use it but if it is fpg area is small then there is also a limitations so that is the one limitation for manufacturer if you want to implement a huge algorithms or say uh, uh algorithms for phase detections and all that types then you have to go for a big fpgs a costly fpgs uh, which provides a large area so that is one limitations and if i get your second questions that from software side there's limitation yes because that's i already told you this is the crux of the fpg so uh, you have to think that uh, you because i think that it will not be a good design if you if you just using the fpg you have to partition your algorithm so such a way that it can use the processor as well and it can use the fpga because now this data bus data connection is is very fast right now so that is that will be a wonderful solution i mean i hope you answered uh, it's okay so uh, is it uh, is it something uh, profitable uh, in terms of uh, for the manufacturers uh, yeah, because yeah 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 yes but, please, uh, please please in this way they are also uh, limiting the scope of their uh, uh design in terms of selling other uh, dedicated embedded products yeah yeah that that that's that is also a market policy because you you know it it all depends on uh, how much uh, uh, non recurring uh, cost the nre cost it depends how much because if you are going for mass productions then the asic is always cheaper but if it is not for mass production and uh, you, you know that you want to use it for a particular product and for a particular chips then i think the fpg is a good solution but that's why i told you that if you are going for a huge productions of embedded systems then then that fpg uh, asic will beat it as a money wise but if it is not a huge productions and for sophisticated applications or say for any high defined car or some space applications you go for it then fpg will be a definitely a good choice and it can beat asic in that way okay uh, so thank you dr shah it's been thank an engrossing much. lecture uh, okay thank you so uh, much you thank highlighted uh, the basic uh, parts of fpg and i hope yeah. the listeners Uh, would be interested for further details in fpg yes okay so thank you thank you for your valuable uh, time and valuable uh, thank talk you. and thank you hope to get you soon or uh, in the near future or far future thanks okay. for your call perfect perfect thank you have a, have a great day all and it's nice to being here okay thank you shondipan thank you bye huh? uh bye okay have a have a great day bye So I request everyone to fill the feedback form. Uh, I'm sending another link. You can try the last link. I hope it will be working. Okay, I think there is some problem. Uh, so one thing uh, we can do is uh, we will send you the feedback link by email. Okay. So then please uh, fill that feedback form. We will send the e-certificates. So thank you.